Prospects for an Asteroid Strike. This is Greg Allison coming to you on the 28th of October, 2020. And I'm doing a joint video here between Galactic Gregs and Green Gregs because this is a topic of space and it's a topic that also impacts prepping, impacts from space or impacts on prepping. We're gonna talk about the prospects for an asteroid that had uh, not too long back been deemed safe uh, as in they thought it wasn't going to hit us. Now they think otherwise that it might, not that it will, but that it can. And that's what we're going to get into. We're going to talk about asteroid Apophis. Yes, Apophis. We're going to also talk, we're going to talk about the science and then we'll talk some, you know, we'll, we'll tease around a little bit about the astrotheological aspects of the name and the foreboding of that. And then we're going to talk about what it means from prepping. So stay tuned. All these things are important. Uh, I guess the middle might be just a little bit fun or interesting, but uh, it's important to know what the real prospects are, where it's coming from, how they derived it, the science behind it. And also we're going to cover um, what you need to do, what you can do to prepare. And it's going to be a lot more challenging for something like this. It's going to mean you're really going to have to keep your eyes wide open and head on a swivel, which is what I tell my followers of Green Graves to do all the time because I pr promised to them my proposition of the Green Graves channel is help them survive, thrive, and stay out of the hive. And Galactic Gregs is a channel about space, space settlement, space development, hope for the future. I do have hope, but we have to get through the times we're in now in order to uh, experience that hope. And that may be, in fact, is a challenge on many levels, one of which I talk about a lot on Green Graves is power grid defense, because where grid goes down, guys, we don't get to play around with going around earth and out and beyond. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we go on, I'm, I got to let you know a little, real, real quick, shameless plug, that I've got a special. Uh, you can support Galactic Gregs and Green Gregs by clicking the links below uh, for offers I make through Galactic uh, Green Gregs. And one of these things is right now, I have got the special website, the special deal with um, uh, my patron supply. And it's called prepwithgreg.com. If you can go to prepwithgreg.com, you will get extra specials. And we got a great special one right now. Four weeks supply of long duration, 25 year good food, which would be good on a space mission, by the way. This because it's lightweight, lasts 25 years, it's dehydrated, freeze dried, and it's real meals. It's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This deal will make you a winner because you get a hundred dollars off and of a four week supply. And it's lightweight. It comes in two buckets for four week supply. You can also get a deal on a two week supply. And this stuff isn't like some of the other products from other vendors, which they, which they depict being shoved across the threshold. This is a lot easier to handle and throw on your rocket or in your canoe. <laughs> it's the best deal for anybody and for you. And look here, breakfast, lunch, dinner. We're talking real meals here, my friends. And it's 2,000 calories per day. And you get also desserts and drinks. Prepwithgreg.com. Now, let's talk about what's coming. Um, Apophis 99942. They had thought that it was going to miss us by looking at it purely from the aspects of the gravitational dynamics. Uh, the uh, uh, when you look at the mechanics of the, the gravitational orbits, uh, it did not look like it was going to hit. So, maybe remember when they first discovered it, there was a scare that it might get us in uh, April 13th, Friday the 13th in April of 2029, but they discovered, no, it isn't going to hit us then. Then they were worried about passing to a certain region in Earth orbit. There's a smaller ellipse that if it were to pass through called a keyhole, keyhole, it would have a likelihood of getting us in 2036. Well, they determined that wasn't the case, but and they thought that we were good thereafter looking at the, just the orbital mechanics uh, of what you do when you run through the gravitational aspects of this. Ah, but there's another effect. <laughs> it's called the Yarkowski effect, and we're going to get all into that. So uh, what happened here is uh, the, the University of Hawaii had an uh, effort going on that was looking at this through the Subaru uh, telescope on Mauna Kea. And the, the principal investigator, the spokesman for the group, is uh, a David uh, Tholen. And Mr. Tholen had the following to say about it. He said essentially that uh, that we were going to have to really look out for an impact in, in 20, uh, 
68. I'll see, I got his direct quote here somewhere if I can pull it up. Yeah, he was talking to, uh, a, he was on an online meeting with a division of the Planetary Sciences uh, 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 Division of the American Astronomical Society. And on the 26th of October, he told them, he said as follows, he says, the 2068 impact scenario needs to be looked at again. <laughs> so uh, what they found is that the probability of this thing hitting us is something like one in 150,000. So, okay, that's not that great, but it's a possibility. It is a possibility. And uh, this effect that they uh, claimed could cause this is their Yarkowski effect. And the Yarkowski effect is basically caused by asymmetric heating. Uh, what happens is, uh, is you got the sun shining on an asteroid, it, it, like it heats up one face. If I get a flashlight around here, I don't have one close by. But on my... <laughs> so the, the sun heats up, you can see a little light from the lights here, heats up one face of the asteroid, but the asteroid spins. And it so happens that the radiation of the heat coming off the asteroid uh, lags the heating of the asteroid. And so what happens with that is that it causes, uh, look, photons actually have momentum. They transfer momentum when they strike and when they're emitted. When they strike you as light and then when they're re-emitted re as heat. But if the heat radiation is a direct, you know, in line with the uh, radiation of the light coming in, you're going to have a net propulsive effect. It's going to be tiny, but over time it adds up in an object in orbit, smaller objects such as asteroids and meteoroids will be impacted by this effect. And it's just a, it's just a, a strange, it's actually a very complicated theory, but the easiest way to explain it is, is just to describe it as an asymmetry between, and or lag between the, the light coming in and the heat being radiated out. So, that is basically what the Yarkowski effect is. And so they've done calculations on this and you, by using that uh, uh, telescope on Mauna Kea, the Subaru, it was a Japanese telescope, by the way, they were using, they, it's like an eight and a half meter telescope. They discovered with that telescope that in fact, the orbit of Apophis is deteriorating something like 170 uh, meters per year on the semi-major axis. Greg, what's a semi-major axis up there? You know what? I'm gonna have to do some screen shares here. <laughs> so I can explain these things to you. So semi-major axis, bing, here we are. <laughs> now you can see an orbit is typically an ellipse. Major axis would go all the way across the length, the long distance of the ellipse. The short distance of the ellipse is the minor axis. Well, apart, let's say to the, to the center centroid uh, uh, of a major axis would be a semi-major axis. So they're not measuring the entire thing, but that would imply that maybe the whole orbit is changing. But uh, as, uh, as you know, an orbit has an apex, the far point and a near point when you go around an object. Uh, for example, let's just say, we'll get the earth and the moon in this process, okay? <laughs> Here's the moon and here's the earth. Although not to scale, this should be a lot smaller. <laughs> we'll just think it's closer to you, right? So as an object orbits, uh, earth is called apogee and perigee, G for earth and geometry, geo. Uh, so if uh, you were orbiting earth and going this way, which is a little polar orbit, just it makes it easier to explain here. As you go out far away, that's the, the apogee as you come in close, that's the perigee. The peri is the short distance of the uh, semi-major axis, and the apogee is the long distance of the semi-major axis. So, you know, the whole thing would be an ellipse. That's the way orbits look. Some ellipses are tighter than others. Some look nearly round, <laughs> like Earth going around the sun, which is not a perfect circle, by the way. Uh, as, as you may know, but the main driver of seasons isn't the fact that the Earth is in a perfect circle going around the sun. It's more the inclination of our hemispheres to the sun. 
that drives our seasons. Although that does have other long-term climatic effects a little bit uh, in terms of uh, other orbital dynamics, but not what we see typically over the course of the year. For example, our, in our Northern hemisphere, when we're having summer, we're actually further away. So <laughs> isn't that interesting? So all that said, um, the, um, is again, you see the semi major axis here. Let's say if I find a picture of this asteroid so that you can tell what it looks like. Bing, here we go. Bam. It's, you know, on its, sim, on its major axis, it's about 450 meters. And for us Americans, that translates a little over 14, about uh, 1,425 feet, something like that, from here to here. And you see it compared with the Eiffel Tower and with the Empire State Building. So if this thing come in, it would hit us really hard. It would be, you know, thousands and thousands of megatons of explosion, of megatons, a million tons of TNT. Uh, by comparison, the weapon, weapons used in Japan, uh, like a little boy with something on the order of 15 kilotons. A megaton is a thousand times more than a kiloton, so just go figure. Um, some of the biggest weapons on a MERV warhead are 10, not the biggest, but tend to be about two megatons. The largest weapon ever detonated on Earth was 50 megatons. The Sarbama, which was the half-scale Sarbama. Uh, they didn't have the cojones to set up a full scale, and a half-scale was horrendous horrendous. So this going off and it would be absolutely tremendous or horrendous. Uh, and it would really cause a lot of damage all around the world. I'm going to explain how that would propagate and what you would need to know to get ready, where's the best places, uh, things to think about. Uh, and even though this thing isn't coming after us, uh, uh, maybe until 2068, uh, uh, there, are, there are other impacts that could hit us that we just don't know about. So we could always get a surprise. Uh, and then down the road, we even have a higher chance of impact from asteroid venue. Yeah, this is this puppy up here that we're, we've, that we're out there getting samples from right now, venue. Bam. you have seen all about this in, in, in the news, uh, science news. I will cover this later because some of the other people are talking about it now. And I'm going to look at it from the I'll look at just the uh, science of the, the retrieval process. Uh, as you can see, Osiris Rex is up there. And uh, Osiris Rex got a, a piece of this and got some of it and is bringing it home uh, and has had awesome science out there at Bennu. Well, it turns out that Bennu is going to have several passes at Earth, uh, particularly uh, in the years ahead uh, between 20, uh, 2169 and 2199 it's going to pass us something like uh, seven times. And in those passes, it's going to have a, a combined probability of impact of 37 in 100,000, which is a bigger impact probability than is currently assigned to asteroid Apophis. And uh, it's thought that venue would impact us with 1,200 megatons impact if it hit us, if it hit us. But still, the probability is, based on what they're telling us, that neither one will hit us. That doesn't mean they won't. <laughs> doesn't mean they will. They're looking at probability because they don't know absolutely what's going to happen with the orbits of these things because they're not, you know, they're kind of like clock driven, but the clock is kind of like a shaky, leaky clock. <laughs> it's got some issues and our observation of it may have some issues or errors and all of that. I'll come back to Bennu later. This is not a Bennu topic because Bennu is, is more likely to hit us and do more damage, but Bennu is definitely uh, a little bit further down the road. The thing was, we wasn't expecting this from Apophis because like I said, they had done the gravitational assessments and it did not lock, look like it was going to get us. And now we know better, unfortunately. So there we are again, Apophis, uh, which is, uh, uh, may come at us. Now, let's talk about what this means from an astrotheological perspective, because the naming is just off the wall. 99942, Apophis. 999 is like 666 turned up. And 42, for those of you who know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is the answer to all things. More interestingly, 42 is the number for the ASCII code for 
the asterisk and the asterisk is the wild card so is the answer to all things that anything goes <laughs> that's what it is using as an asterisk and programming and searching and things like that right so kind of weird kind of weird uh maybe maybe 42 does go with the upside down 666 whatever that means <laughs> but the stranger yet is that apophis has you know apophis means doom it means uh gloom it means uh uh, giant serpent. The, the inner, you know, it was Apophis was the inner. that was the uh, Egyptian god, the enemy of the sun god Ra. Apophis uh, is also called Apep, and is associated with earthquakes, thunder, darkness, storms. Well, if it hits, we get all that right. Uh, it's linked with Set, which is kind of the Egyptian Satan, right? Set Satan. Uh, it's also tied with uh, chaos, disorder. And I said darkness. Well, when these things hits, the Earth's going to get a lot of dust on up in the atmosphere, and you will have darkness. You'll have a nuclear type winter, an asteroid winter, volcanic, whatever you want to call it. The, the Earth would be shrouded in the cloud of the ejecta, but you'll have to get burned up for that. So, we're, what are the effects of an impact? Let's talk about, well, we'll finish this little astrotheological thing because Apophis also uh, sounds a lot like Apollyon or Abaddon in Greek. Well, let me just turn to where Apollyon, it's got almost the same definition. So let me stop the share. Bam. <laughs> Hello. In this King James Version, uh, there is a reference to something that if you turn to chapter nine in the book of Revelations, and maybe I should put on my eyeballs the because this type is mighty small here. Hang on, bear with me just a second. If you don't believe in this stuff, but yeah, hey, look, we're just talking about the astrotheological aspect of it, and I'm not requiring you follow in belief, but it's just highly interesting here. Chapter nine says, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven upon the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Well, if you fall from heaven to the earth as an asteroid, you're definitely going to knock a big hole in the earth. And it would look like a bottomless pit. Remember, the asteroid hit Chicxulub, created a crater 20 miles deep. It's huge. Just like most of our atmosphere is only 20 miles high. 20 miles high is where I send my balloons to, and you're over 99% of the atmosphere, 20 miles deep. But that was also 110 miles across. <laughs> and and Chicxulub impact threw a whole mountain of debris into escape velocity from Earth. I mean, the, the amount of, of material probably almost like what hit Earth went into space. Part of Earth went bye-bye. A lot of that did come back and fall down upon us. But the escape boss at least got it out in low Earth orbit. A lot of it went to the moon, <laughs> Mars, and Venus, and beyond. And from that, you know, uh, our sun has traveled around the solar system on an arc for 65 million years. And life may be seeded all around planets coming from the inner cores of, uh, of rock that uh, analysis showed might not have got heated uh, to the point of sterilizing it. <laughs> so Earth may have seeded the cosmos as we may have been seeded prior to that. Panspermia, by, by the way, is that concept. But the most interesting uh, verse in here, in Revelations, the book of, uh, of the great revealing or what we often fear and associate with Armageddon, which fits with what we're talking about, Armageddon, right? Armageddon. Polyon, abandoned, Apophis, set. Don't they all kind of fit together? But get this, here's the, here's the key verse. It's Revelations 9, 11. I kid you not. Nine, 11, Revelations, the book of the end, 9, 11. What does 9, 11 say? And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue, hath the name Apollyon. This is where he's named in this book, the book of the doom <laughs> or the great revealing. Revelations 9, 11. Holy smoke, can you believe that? <laughs> 9, 11, that date means something to us. That number means something to us, right? Is a date, 9, 11. In the book, on the book of the end, and it's the, a name that's synonymous with Apophis. So it's like Apophis is the Egyptian name. Apollyon, Abaddon would be the Greek name of Apollo. No, the, the Hebrew name of Apollo. 
<laughs> excuse me, Apollyon would be the great name. Wow. Well, okay, I'm done with that part. <laughs> I know my space friends are, are sitting on pins and needles and saying, hey, shut up, get on. <laughs> well, guys, it's just too strange to be true. It's so weird. And 9 11, you know, you know what? <laughs> when were these verses divided up that way? And when King James ruled England, maybe earlier, but I think my <coughs> sir, uh, Sir Francis Bacon oversaw the writing of this thing. He was the coordinator of, of all that, trying to turn the Bible into verse and uh, describe what they saw in the universe according to their worldview, right? Wow, 9 11. Weird, 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 weird. Okay. <laughs> so, an impact from an asteroid when it hits Earth, a really big one, uh, as it's coming down, like, yeah, this is Earth here. As it's coming, it's coming in, uh, you know, something like 45,000 miles per hour. I mean, you don't, you won't even see it. You're going to be sitting around one day, sipping your, your tea. And the next second, you are fried. It'll be a flashlight, you're gone. Just like that. Bam. You know, you're not going to be looking up in the sky. Like, oh, no, here it comes. It's going to be here and bam. You might get a glimmer of the bright light before you're fried if you're that close to it. Um, it will heat up, compress the air on its way down right before it impacts the Earth. The air between it and the Earth, especially if it's a really big one, can be hotter than the surface of the sun. Maybe many times. I'm thinking at Chicxulub, it was like a, 10 times hotter than the surface of the sun. It was already melting the Earth below it as it was coming in. And, you know, uh, an asteroid like you know, like that was ten miles uh, up. It was already above the troposphere at the top when the bottom was on the ground. <laughs> well, it was well up there, you know. Hey, I like I said, my balloons float, you know, twice that level at you know twenty miles, not ten miles, you know. Holy smoke, guys, that's crazy. So um, uh, it went well. It might have been six miles. It was ten kilometers, but. So, or at least that's what they think. They're not absolutely sure, but there's there's some bigger asteroids out there. So, uh, when it hits, it's going to you know vaporize basically, and, and the rock beneath it vaporizes. Everything vaporizes. All that momentum is transferred, and then you have the recoil, the rebound. Uh, you know, just like when you drop a, a something in a, a little puddle of water, you'll see that big drop it pop right back up in the center. And you'll see that in a lot of craters on the moon. There's that little uh, mountain right in the center of a crater. That's what that is. It's the rebound. Well, some of that is going out to orbit. It's going in space. Uh, so a lot of your atmosphere is going to be lost. When you get a really big impact, uh, I would submit that your atmosphere on your planet is not going to be as thick as it was. So maybe the high altitude mountains aren't the best place to be because you may get asphyxiation. It may be hard to breathe. Now, especially since uh, a lot of photosynthesis will be shut down after this hits. So you, you, you're going to suffer asphyxiation at high altitude. So high altitudes is not a place to be if you're prepping. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chan Thomas story aside here. <laughs> you know, maybe that would change it. Mm, I can talk about Chan Thomas later. I'm going to do talk about where to go when you prep. Uh, where to go to get away, to bug out, to survive. What's the best places? I'll do you know, A lot of channels have done that. I'll have my own take on that. And, and I'm sure you'll be interested in that. So the uh, impact uh, will throw out this ejecta. So the first thing you're going to have is the, the, the flash of light, the heat wave, uh, the, the air blast. Uh, you're going to have a heck of a blast of air, just like with a, a nuclear detonation, but this will be far more powerful. And if it hits water, you're going to have a ginormous tsunami. It was thought this tsunami from Chicxulub for some point out was something like as high as the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, but it does fall off and then verse square laws already it's outward, fortunately. But it's gonna make a long distance before it's down to some level that you might not be concerned with. So it would take out a good fraction of the world wherever it hits if it's that big. Now, a and this big is the thing that hit Chicxulub, Chicxulub uh, which is the Yucatan Peninsula in uh, Mexico. But Apophis is huge still big enough to maybe not be the, kill as many species. It won't kill as many as uh, Chicxulub event did, 
but it, it could wipe out species. It could change climate on earth. It wouldn't do all that. It would be a civilization in an event. And for many species, an extinction event, but it would be a civilization in an event. Civilization is far more fragile than survival of the species. In fact, civilization is very fragile. And I've done a video on that where I use a number two pencil to describe why it, no one person knows how to make one of these. And it takes a cast of, of thousands, tens of thousands, and from a story written back in the 1950s, which is far more true today. Uh, I did that video called The Fragility of Civilization. Now, check it out. It's in my channel. Maybe I'll put a link to it. The, uh, the thing to consider here is that this ejecta goes out. And it, once it gets out into space, it's going to form little spheres. And most of them just be glass, essentially, because most of our surface is silicon. And it comes raining back down on the earth. And it's coming at a very high velocities. And it's all over the place coming back. This stuff is going to uh, form what's called teakites. We can find beds of teakites in the ocean floor and other places, beds of these little glass beads that are shaped like teardrops where they came through the atmosphere. These, when these things are re-entering the atmosphere, they're gonna be heating the atmosphere. You're gonna have them all over the place. The atmosphere, it's thought that the atmosphere will heat like an oven as far as these things go, thousands of miles. The atmosphere would be like 400 degrees hot. You're gonna be on the surface, you're going to roast. If you're further away from this event, you know, one of the things that's gonna happen after it hits, is the air here is gonna be so superheated, the impact itself, you're gonna have a ginormous mushroom cloud. And some of that gas going up from that heat is not coming back. <laughs> and some of that will go into escape velocity. Uh, or, or just escape Earth because it got so high, and uh, you know, the, the, the it's outside of our magnetosphere, and the sun, solar wind will just sweep some of that away. We erode the atmosphere every time we take a major impact. I would submit that's why we can't have, we don't have animals today the size of a brontosaurus, or you don't have two foot sized insects. It's not because the oxygen content is less; it's because there's less of it pushing in. You know, I'll cover that in another video, but. So, but on the other side of the earth or, or some distance away from this, the air is getting sucked away because this air is going to appear. When air pressure drops dramatically, you freeze. So the first thing you're going to know over here is you're freezing. And the next thing you're going to know, you'll be flash frozen almost. If the tea cats reach you, you'll be burning. So you're going to freeze, then you're going to roast. <laughs> and if you're too close, you'll have a tsunami. It's going to take you out the most. Uh, so you got a lot of horrendous, atmospheric effects. So if you're on the surface of the earth and one of these things hits, and it all depends on the size of it. The size is gonna matter a lot in this uh, scenario. What do I do on the earth? I, I lost the earth. Oh, we lost the world, folks. <laughs> anyway, uh, I found earth. Good, we're safe. Got the whole world in my hands. <laughs> so if one of these hits, you're gonna have localized damage around the impact zone from the direct blast. Then you have the teakites coming out and that's the place you most don't wanna be. The fortunate thing is with these bigger asteroids, we're gonna know before they hit us. Hopefully we'll know where they hit us. You might be able to get up and move maybe. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. If you live right at the impact zone, especially right there in the blast zone, forget it. <laughs> forget it, you are gone. There's no discussion, it's over. That's all there is to say. Um, now, let's think about this. Let's just say one hits, uh, well, let's talk about the Chicxulub event. The Chicxulub event hit right here in uh, Mexico, on the Yucatan Peninsula. If you put a pencil, what's gonna happen is a shock wave will travel around the world. The whole crust of earth is shaken. Yeah, I mean, it is like you're on the deck of a boat, even if you're way out here in the middle. The whole crust is going to have this big shock wave going through it, and it's going to travel around the world. But when it gets on the opposite side of the world, it's going to really crack the crust up so bad, you're going to have major volcanism on the other side of the earth. So you don't want to be where the impact is, nor do you want to be exactly on the other side of the world away from. In the case of Chicxulub, that place was where the Deccan traps occurred, where there was huge major 
volcanic activity. Now, some people say that predates the Chicxulub event a whole lot, but it's highly interesting that the Deccan Traps is right opposite the Chicxulub impact. And an impact like that would give you what you get at the Deccan Traps. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, the Deccan Traps were just there and they predated it by a long shot, blah, 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 blah. Eh. Yeah, I suspect that. I, I am highly suspicious. <laughs> Maybe true, maybe coincidental. Coincidences happen, but holy smoke! <laughs> of course, maybe the the gods that were at the time didn't like the dinosaurs. Hmm, the best place to hit the Earth is on the opposite side from the Deccan Traps. So let's make sure we throw it right there. I mean, if you were really aiming to do the most damage. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. I'm talking funny stuff there, but you got to have some fun, even when you're talking about doom and Armageddon, right? So. The thing here is that uh, with an impact like that, you've got several things to take into account. You don't want to be where it hits or on the opposite side from where it hits. You don't want to be uh, within, I would say, 2,000 miles of the impact zone. If you can get out, get out. Further away, the better. You don't want to be back on the opposite side of the earth, though. Maybe, you know, somewhere kind of in the middle. You know, say if it hit here, you would want to be here, or maybe it's a little bit more on the other side. I'd prefer to be a little bit more on the other side, but you know, go what you can. Now, if you have to be in the impact zone, um, it may be such that you, um, your survival, you know, I shouldn't have a chart up here. Um, you need to dig in. Underground's the best place to be, underground. Because when the sky starts roasting, uh, you need some protection overhead. You need thermal mass or even water. You don't want to be too deep underground, especially if you're real close to it, because your cave, your bunker may collapse due to all the shaking. It may collapse, caverns may collapse, caves will collapse, tunnels may collapse. You're gonna have all kinds of bad side effects from all that shaking. So bunkers are gonna be of limited value. If you're in a bunker that has, uh, you know, like they're using ISO ship containers, something that keeps the, the what's on you from falling in on you, and it's dirt, maybe a couple of feet of dirt, you might be okay. Hopefully that's in the thermal mass because a teakite rain won't last forever, we hope. How long is earth gonna bake in the sky? I don't know. Again, it depends on the size of it and just a lot of things that we probably won't know until such a thing happens. Eventually such a thing will happen, but until it does, you know, uh, what else you can do is maybe be underwater. Water is a great thermal moderator. And it may be the best place to be because you won't be suffer from the, the winds, the atmosphere. But again, you don't want to be too close to that event because the waters are going to churn and broil uh, within a thousand miles. And, and the sound waves travel through the water too. And the sound waves are going to be horrendous. The sound waves alone will kill most sea life, especially mammals that, that are, are, are sound sensitive. So the sea life will be at great risk uh, from the uh, concussion wave traveling through the water. But if you're in a metal hull this vessel uh, and, and you've got it you know, moored or something, it's not so deep that pressure is going to crush you to start with, uh, but yet you're deep enough that the water is going to help you overhead, that may be the best, very best survival place, uh, or maybe you know, even in a lake, like to be the ocean. But then again, you got to consider that the lake might be doing a lot of sloshing. <laughs> so uh, underground, uh, with uh, something overhead that covers you, uh, or even on the surface of Earth, you, uh, you know, I've got a universal habitat concept. And let me show it to you. Give me a second. That's what I was looking for. I thought I had it at my ready disposal. I don't, but I'm going to grab it real fast and share with you a habitat that you can build on the Earth that uh, would be the best kind of home you could build anyway, which would have good, strong, a lot better survival characteristics than a regular home and give you a chance of surviving this if you're not at ground zero. And this, if you were to cut it in half and look edge on into it, might look something like this part here, forget that. This part here would be your work quarters, your living quarters, and your yard. And uh, I've got other pictures of this. I don't have them at my fingertips uh, for people to live on on Earth. 
This is looking straight down floor plan. This is the upstairs part where your living quarters. And all this is a tenth of an acre. I call this a device unit because you can grow all the food you need on this property. Grow all the food you need. And with this workshop area down here, you can produce stuff. You can work from home, grow your food from home, make a living at home. And this is intended to have thick thermal mass. So you could have good environmental footprint. Uh, you would have like zero impact on earth and it would be able to absorb the heat, a lot of the heat of an event like that. Uh, if you build out of sandbags, it can take the shaking and the quaking a lot better. And so you could have a home you can make a living out of, live out of, and live in harmony with earth. I call it my harmony universal habitat. Now that particular zone is one I drew to go in my Venetian atmosphere habitat. This thing was intended to be able to house over 16,000 people a mile in diameter. Yes, it can be built. It will float. See my uh, Galactic Greatest video on that, by the way. And I'm working up other concepts. I'm going to do follow on videos, several follow on videos on Galactic Greatest on this habitat. Now, the beauty, the hope is if we survive the things coming at us, uh, they, these are, we could be building these things in the 2030s, late 2030s mid to late 2030s. We could be building these on Venus, literally. <laughs> so that's before Apophis is scheduled to make a near pass. And it's thought it would come in underneath our geosynchronous satellites. Now, Greg, you know, that's under our main communication satellites, the ones that you look at that in their same spot in the sky over the Earth. The, geo, the Earth is 8,000 miles in diameter. Geosynchronous orbit, see, in orbit, if you're orbiting close to Earth, like or the lower orbit, you go around the Earth about, you got to be traveling 17,500 miles an hour or something like that. So you, you go around the Earth once every 90 minutes. But as you get higher and higher, you're actually going faster, but your circle is bigger and you, you go around the Earth less often, even though you're actually traveling faster. But there is an orbit where you go around the Earth at exactly the same rate the Earth spins. So if you're on the Earth looking up, that satellite's always right there overhead. It don't move from your perspective. That orbit is 22,000, about 500 miles out. So 22, 23,000 miles out is the range of what we call geosynchronous orbit. Geo for Earth, synchronous is synchronized with Earth, like 22,500 miles. So Earth is 8,000 miles, well, 22,000, you know, so, so you can fit several Earths going out into that, right? <laughs> so that's that gives you uh, four Earths getting out. <laughs> so that that's pretty pretty neat right so, you know two earths to 16 four is 24 <laughs> not quite four earths and uh, going out but there's still a lot of room between geosync and earth we get really concerned though when an asteroid comes in underneath the geosynchronous silence that's pretty close but it's still a lot of room to miss you know if the earth is here that's a big circle around that means hey it's coming in close to you it's getting close there's something to wake you up Apophis will make that kind of a close approach to us. So don't say Greg Allison said Apophis will hit us. I didn't say that. I said it can. That was This was the new revelation. They thought that it wasn't going to, that it couldn't. But now they know it can. And we know a venue can. I actually started a presentation. I made several charts on a venue presentation. I just didn't finish it. This was months and months ago. Actually, I think I started a year ago on my Galactic Greg's channel. I will come back to that and we'll talk about venue in the future on Galactic Greg's. Um, I cover this as a joint video because it covers the space topic and prepping because you need to get ready. You need to know what you got to do to get ready. Uh, and one of these things hits, you're not going to be able to, nobody's going to be growing food for a few years because photosynthesis will fail on earth. Temperatures are going to drop. That's why a home built like my design uh, with all the thermal mass will be far better for you from temperature, from uh, the, the wind shock, from the thermal shock, from the sky overheating, uh, from many, many, many aspects. You could even uh, over the open courtyard and right over the home hang, you know, build you like a dome, a uh, geodesic dome or something and uh, hang bottles of water to absorb, help absorb the heat. You know, uh, uh, even radiation in case uh, you have a nuclear event. <laughs> so you, you can make these homes very survivable or you can build an analog of that underground. But part of that essentially is underground. That's the cool thing about my concept is it basically is an open ground, underground habitat, <laughs> raised ground, you might say, because if you see the thickness here, that's two foot thick, the way I drew it out. That is dirt, basically, sandbags, whatever, or whatever the best analog you can get to it is 
will be on Venus. And I will be covered. How to mine Venus. A lot of people are making this up. Oh, you, you can't mine Venus. You got to everything from Earth. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not the truth. I will talk about that in follow on videos on Galactic Gregs about Venus, colonizing Venus. All right. Enough said about all those things. Uh, subscribe to my channel. Subscribe to Green Gregs, where I teach you how to survive, thrive, and stay out of the hive. And I, I bring you news all, all the time, so you can hit, you keep your eyes wide open, head on the swivel. I'll try to tell you what's going on in the world. And so for Green Gregs, this is a combo, eyes wide open, head on the swivel, although it's a little bit down the road, and how to get ready. Of course, it could be that, you know, one day, anytime, we might get work. Uh, oh, NASA has found an asteroid heading this way, and it's a biggie. And we've done our calculations, and here it's going to hit. Well, now you know what to do. If you hear that news, you know you don't want to be here or anywhere around it, and you know what to do when you go somewhere else. Now, okay, you might not have time to build a home like that. Hopefully, we'll have homes like around the world where this thing happens. But, hey, that's mostly sandbags. You got a shovel or a backhoe, you can do some digging real fast. Get you a nice ship container and throw stuff on top of it. <laughs> uh, get your submarine. <laughs> yeah, st still one from the drug runners from uh, Columbia, right? <laughs> you know, they, they're running submarines. Oh my gosh. So, you know, I have a little fun with some of my topics a little bit. Even though I talk about gloom and doom, you got to keep a sense of humor. Don't ever let them get you down. But that's when they run you in the ground. All right, my friends, uh, stay safe, stay real. This can happen. It is a reality. Oh, one more thing. I did do a vid, a, a asteroid impact video. I always thought it would be first done on galactic Gregs, But no, I did my first asteroid impact video on green Gregs. The reason I did it was as follows. There was a channel out there back in August, um, I've been in July, who made the claim that they had contacts in the Defense Department, in the Pentagon, and contacts in intelligence agencies. Two independent contacts, each telling them the same story, saying that we were going to, Earth was going to get swept into debris from interstellar space. Uh, they claimed this was debris coming from the planet Nibiru. And that we, that they claimed that by September, no one would be, well, of course, they were quoting their source. They didn't say this themselves. And by the way, I'm not going to name this channel. That's actually a really good channel. I think they just got some bad advice here. And maybe it's a psyop to discredit channels like them and us. Somebody might have been feeding them just to make them look bad. It's a possibility. But the, the claim was that no one would be able to deny before the end of September that something big comes this way. Nibiru, basically. It would be there. It would be self-evident. Everybody would see it. And there'd be all these asteroids coming in. We'd all know it. And it would be starting to hit us. I did a video debunking that right before September started. I said, nope. Nibiru comes not this way. Ain't happening. Ain't coming. Let's see. A lot of people think I'm a fear porn channel. No. When I know something is not happening, I'm going to hit it. And it made a lot of people mad. Oh, Greg, how can you say that? You don't know that. These guys, blah, 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 blah. Okay. I am in the space community. I work space as a contractor day and night. And I'm massively connected to, because I've been doing space in my social universe. I've been the chairman of the executive committee, which is the CEO of the National Space Society. And I've also served as the chairman of the policy committee of the National Society, Space Society is 10 years. Not in which I was executive vice president. And I started three chapters of it back in its former glory days known as the L5 Society, uh, which is a society for colonization in space, by the way. And I started the Cumberland L5 Society, the North Star L5 Society, and the Huntsville, Alabama, HAL 5 Society. So <clears throat> I know a little bit about space. I'm massively connected to space people. On my Facebook page, there's probably a thousand astronomers in that and other people that work space from many different companies all over the world. Greg, NASA, NASA, man, the heck with NASA. I'm talking all over the world. I'm talking space agents, companies, independent organizations, volunteers, amateur astronomers. Let me tell you something. Amateur astronomers usually cite uh, uh, comets when they're way out at Jupiter. They don't escape. So how in the heck are you going to sneak a planet in on us and nobody see it? 
I guess it's coming from the other side of the sun. I've heard it so much. You know what? Orbital mechanics don't allow that. You can't sneak up on Earth from the other side of the sun coming from way out in the solar system because you got to orbit. And we're going to see it. You know, can hide. The only way, the only way anything can always be on the other side of the sun from Earth all the time is if it's in Earth orbit, in the L3 part orbit of the sun Earth system. So, and then if it's there, it ain't coming. You will never see it. So guess what? There is no Nibiru coming this way anytime soon. And the other thing about all this debris. And there's sight, the asteroids just come. So well, we've got these asteroids coming. Let me tell you something about these asteroids coming. They're all coming in the range of 40 something, you know, 20 something, 40, 50 something thousand miles per hour. They all have orbits that go around the sun, pretty much circular, elliptical, that we understand. They all fit in the family of well known, well defined asteroids that are not coming in from another planetary system, another star system in our interstellar space. We've had two interstellar visitors and in, come into our solar system, but they came and went. That was interesting. <laughs> no kidding. And they were very different. A mall mouth, oh, however you pronounce it, was highly interesting. But, <laughs> but kind of like the device that we just, uh, Arthur Hart wrote his novel about rendezvous with Brahma. Check that out. That's the first thing I thought when they talked about this long cigar shaped asteroid. It was really metallic looking. Uh, mm, interesting. <laughs> it's said to have accelerated, but they think it was the light pressure on it that did it. Was it the Yarkowski effect? No, I didn't have time to do that. <laughs> what was it? How did it happen? You know, there's still some mysteries there, my friends. <coughs> Maybe it did act like a solar cell. Solar cell, light cells were the photons from the sun striking something, uh, impart a, a, a net momentum on it and push it away. But most solar cells are intended to be very lightweight, like atom thick structures that stretch over miles and miles and collect sunlight to be pushed. A big ast asteroid project? Hey, interesting. I don't know. <laughs> Just asking. Answer those questions for me, my friends. What is it? What was it? Why did it do that? So we have covered the ground here. We've talked about this impact with Apophis. We've talked about a little bit Bennu, and we'll talk about uh, an asteroid that may hit us in 2880. Uh, so there's other things to look at out there, and there's things that we may not know about. But you now you've got some idea of what to do if you know someone's coming at us. And this is the reason we need to develop and call it space, by the way. We got all our eggs in one basket called planet Earth. And that's not a good way for survival. So the ultimate prep and for our species, the ultimate prepping is not to have all our eggs in one basket, it's to diversify and go elsewhere. Put our habitats in other places, such as the atmosphere of Venus, the surface of Mars, or in free space rotating facilities like the O'Neillian cylinders. Put our habitats out, spread them around, and make, put a few underground. <laughs> on these different places. Hey, burrow into an asteroid and create a hollow it out and make a habitat therein. Another thing that we can do is we start mining asteroids, we're developing technology to divert them so they won't hit Earth. You know, if the dinosaurs had had a space program, <laughs> they might still be around. Unless somebody just aimed that thing. Yeah, let's sit right on the opposite side of the deck and trust. Wow, this is a perfect pull. That'll get rid of these environments. <laughs> nah. We have a little fun on galactic grapes and green grapes on occasion. So there you go, my friends. Strange stuff. It is a real possibility. Asteroid impacts will eventually get us. As the sun will go into uh, CME before then, probably take out our power grid if we don't do something to harden our power grid. So if we can make sure we got our power grid hardened and we don't act crazy and go into a, 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 a war on the surface of the earth, a nuclear war, civil wars, anything that would bring down our civilization. Once civilization fails, it may not come back ever. And then we'll, we'll just sit around until something puts us out of our existence. This is why we need to survive and thrive and, and, and keep civilization going. That's what we need to do. And then one day we can be a growing out in space and, and then we're survivable because all our eggs are no longer in one basket. If we get homes out in other star systems, that's even better, we're far more survivable. So there you go, my friends. The ultimate prep, the ultimate bug out is in space. <laughs> and the most immediate, the easiest bug out I submit to you is on the surface of 
not the surface, no. <laughs> it's in the atmosphere. I was checking you there. Venus. See my Galactic Greg's video on that. And, but I, oh, I'm not ignoring Mars. I've got a sim of my habitat on Mars. First one we did. Anyway, everyone, um, to, to, to uh, let me know that you've watched this video this far, say, Greg, I'm with you. We need, we need to be a multi-world civilization. If you don't believe that, you say, Greg, I don't believe that. But then at least I don't know you watch this video this far. <laughs> Everyone, now I will say thank you for watching.